Hello, everyone, and thank you here for joining us for another lovely talk, Tech Talk, that we are doing here with uh, Vissam Khuri, who is the general manager uh, for both uh, for Finastra, both for the APAC market as well as Middle East and Africa market. Um, so, I mean, you know, Vissam has such a colorful career uh, of about 20 years in financial institutions and working in the financial industry that he has spent. And today at Finastra, he is probably looking at one of the most important aspects of fintech, which is open banking and innovation and digital transformation of banking. So welcome, Vissam. We really uh, appreciate your taking our time and talking to us at Entrepreneur APAC and would love to hear, uh, you know, APAC is one of the most forward markets when it comes to fintech and, you know, some of the, they have been very early in terms of uh, whether it's Singapore or uh, other markets within Middle East Asia, we see the kind of fintech um, sort of forwardness that they have shown, which has not been shown by the other markets in the world. So would love to know about your views uh, as to what you think is the new normal of banking that we are likely to see um, in the coming time. Um, so, you know, let me start with the, one of the very basic questions. And because, you know, we are talking to one of the smartest fintech markets in the whole world, what kind of fintech trends do you see in APAC in the coming times? I mean, you know, and given the fact that pandemic has already given a better leeway to uh, for digitization of banking and for better fintech uh, capabilities to be built up. Um, so what kind of new fintech trends is it that you are seeing happening now? Sure. Thank you very much for having me, Ritu, and for your kind words. Uh, I look forward for a very interactive discussion. And like you've mentioned, uh, let me start from the end. Definitely, the pandemic has accelerated the requirement for digitalization. It has brought really the future forward, in the best way to describe it. Uh, even before the pandemic, uh, the rush for digitalization uh, has been the, at the forefront of financial institutions uh, and has led to the emergence of fintechs. And uh, I'll be dismissive if I don't mention that the, the key advantage or the reason why fintechs have been created mostly comes from the concept of open banking. And for the audience that are, uh, that are listening to this, uh, if I want to define open banking in its simplistic form, open banking is to be able to share financial information with third parties. In as simple as it sounds, but that has created huge possibilities. And these possibilities uh, are around creation of fintech, smaller organization that can utilize this financial information in order to create uh, user-friendly solutions that are targeted for two main reasons. Number one, increase customer satisfaction uh, and make sure that there's competitiveness across the financial services. And number two, obviously create a new and innovative way on uh, uh, in terms of digitalization and creating new services. And back to your question, what do we see the trends in fintechs? The trends that I can see in fintechs, we can talk a lot about specific apps or specific applications, but the, ma the major change in the fintech world, in my point of view, is the collaboration, is the concept of opening. Open, not only open banking, open banking, open APIs, open collaboration. If you don't have open APIs, which is the, the best way to describe it, is the technology that allows to share data in a very safe and secure manner, then open banking will not exist. So the biggest trend, the biggest thing that I can see uh, changing in the coming two to three years is the nature of the collaboration between uh, fintechs and uh, traditional incumbent banks. Uh, previously, if you think of it, uh, traditional banks used to look at fintechs as a main competitor. The exactly. biggest problem for, for a financial institution is that they never knew who the competitors could be. And these days, because Amazon could be a competitor, Google could be a competitor with all their payment tools and all the rest. So at the forefront of it, they said they were like, oops, there's a new competitor in the market, what should I do? Later on, they found out that the only way that they can ride that wave of digitalization is to collaborate with these fintechs. And open banking is the only tool that allows for that collaboration to happen. So in my point of view, our next development, and we can talk about it, is the evolution of financial services and the solutions provided in the market. To, if, you, if you look historically, as a, as a financial service pro provider, as Finastra, and being one of the third largest uh, in the world, uh, we started by going to a bank and tell them, what do you want? And we created something called a project. 
Then we moved to productizing that project and we started selling products. And then we moved again and we started selling solutions. These days we are selling more of an open platform and we're moving ahead. Next level is to become a marketplace. And in the open platform and the marketplace, fintechs have a key role to play uh, uh, in the development of financial services. Sure. And I think you rightly said that, you know, banks never thought that they were going to have any kind of competition. Uh, um, and I mean, nobody ever expected fintech to pave out the way it has. But today, you know, they're facing competition, whether it comes to credit, you know, there are uh, in APAC, we're seeing already these small uh, uh, non-banking financial institutions which are providing payments today. And then there are now different uh, payment gateways for cross-border transactions as well as for um, you know, domestic transactions. So particularly you know, in the coming times, how do you see the banking system changing? Or you know, in the next four to five years, do you think banks are going to cut down on certain roles and sort of uh, become heavier on, let's say, only debt or or some other functions. Um, so, I mean, is, is there some kind of uh, uh, future pave for banking also that we are thinking about? Yeah, that's, that's an excellent question. And, and I, can, I can flip that around and say, what will FinTech mostly contribute to the new evolution of the banking services? And to, to answer that, if you allow me, let's talk about the differences between FinTechs and banks for one second. Uh, there's a natural difference between both. So in a survey we've done a couple of years back, we've asked, we've asked banks, how much of what you do, you put the customer at the center? And we got replies of around a bit over 50% of all what we do is customer focused. And that's normal, and mainly for two reasons, if I, if, if I want to narrow it down. Number one, banks have different considerations, risk management, regulations, compliances, and that hinders them from becoming only customer centric. Mm -hmm. Second, Technology. Banks are, have been there for ages. It's one of the oldest things that happen in the world. So they are hindered by technology. We've asked the same question to fintechs. How much of what you do, you put the customer at the center? And the answer was in the top 80% of all what we do is to put the customer in the center. This 30% or so difference between the two has created that, that, if you like, gap between what banks could offer and what fintechs could offer. So if you look at the banking services today, Obviously, we're going to move to digitalization. That's right. for sure. What will banks differ in terms of offering services? Couple of things. And this is exactly what we do. I've, I, all, I first introduced Finastra as the third largest, as one of the third three large companies, fintechs in the world. But actually, that's an old definition. As of 2020, we define ourselves as the first open platform for collaboration in finance. So we have created a platform and that platform will allow the conventional banks to be able to expose their APIs and invite innovation from anywhere. Innovation cannot be cannibalized by anybody, not even us. So by utilizing that platform, uh, banks could be able to rely on their own developers. They can go to any system integrator. They could go to any FinTech and start adding their services on top of the solutions that they have. So the main change that I see uh, from the financial comp or banks in terms of services is now they're going to offer third party services. It's not going mm -hmm. to offer their own services in a very consumer digital focused uh, manner. Banks today, are, what's the biggest threat for a bank? The biggest threat for a bank is customer uh, satisfaction and customer loyalty. Banks have balance, big balance sheets and they continue to be profitable in comparison to fintechs, but they are losing customers because they are not customer centric. On the other hand, fintechs have small balance sheets and it's their own business, like any internet company, they know how to acquire clients, that's their business. Their problem is profitability and margin. They, and and that's, a, that's a, a, a inherent problem by the definition of fintechs. By combining both under a platform, that brings value to both of these, the fintechs and the banks, in the benefit at the end of the consumer. The consumer can be a retail like you and me, such as payments, and we can discuss that and the growth of payment, or it can be a corporate or small medium enterprise or any type of business that can benefit from this collaboration between both. But I mean, what are the regulatory hurdles do you see, particularly from central banking authorities of a country, you know, because they, they are the ones who control the bank. So now they would obviously, I don't know, maybe I would say become an impediment rather than a, a sort of, a, you know, a, a friend in uh, this collaboration to happen. So 
what kind of regulatory hurdles are there for this collaboration sure. to happen? Your comment is spot on. When we did our own survey in Asia PAC uh, and across the across the world, uh, across the world, 56% of our respondents said that the uh, regulations are not uh, in place in order to facilitate the growth of fintechs and the digitalization. Because look, open banking, the idea of open banking has to be number one, supported by regulations. Like you said, banks are highly regulated. And number two, technology has to be standardized in order for it to, to operate. There are lots of uh, regulatories that are facilitating this, but not enough. When I say facilitating this, and I can give you lots of examples in Singapore or in Hong Kong, where the open banking framework has, has been well defined. In Singapore, the adoption of open banking is enormous. And keep in mind that they haven't made it even mandatory. They have just created the flexibility and the encouragement for the financial institutions to go into open banking. In Hong Kong, similarly, since 2018, if not before, they started also pushing uh, open banking uh, concepts. Having said that, uh, the regulation is not standardized across the globe, and it's not definitive on how that collaboration could happen. In my view, what regulators could do is to encourage putting these two together and not only uh, uh, allow for open banking and open APIs, but encourage the synergies between, uh, uh, between the two. Um, in India, for example, and I know we're discussing you're based out of India, uh, India is a market where the regulators uh, uh, have created companies or non-financial companies in order to provide financial services which is not part of the banking sector, which has created a, a bit of friction. Uh, uh, the payments in, in, in China, for example, has been enormous in terms of digital payments. Uh, in our study, we've seen that, um, or actually in a third party IDC study, I've seen that over 99% of, uh, of non-cash payments in, in China are digital digital payments such as uh, uh, we, we pay or alipay or, uh, or or these types of uh, of payments while across uh, and 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 this 99 transactions or 99 percent of the transactions that are done digitally is via wallets uh, account for almost 45 percent of the global transactions that are coming via 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 wallets so payment is definitely one of the biggest routes uh, that have penetrated uh, open banking and the regulations have helped with that. Is there a room for improvement? For sure. Is there a room for standardization? Definitely. And this is happening in different countries at a, at a different pace, but the, the trajectory is very well known. That open banking collaboration is the way forward for the financial sector to be able to advance and provide innovative solutions. Sure. You know, you mentioned that, uh, you know, uh, uh, there are different uh, payment gateways in China. Similarly, they are in India and lots of other countries now. And, you know, while I totally agree that digitization is making, and particularly digital payments, if I can talk about it for a minute, is making mm -hmm. our life easy, but it's also getting already becoming, and it's still early days, but it's already becoming a very competitive landscape there. I mean, you know, if you're an e-commerce site and you realize that one payment gateway is offering you more discounts, if you sort of use their gateway to buy something out of an Amazon or someplace. So now, you know, now instead of making it very consumer friendly, it's becoming extremely confusing for the customer, if you really ask me, and as to, you know, uh, I mean, because it seems that he has to, then he or she has to spend a lot of time in trying to figure out what and how to do things. Now, while I understand competition is healthy and it keeps everybody on their feet, but I mean, for the customer's point of view, how can we make it simpler for him to choose his or her or stick to one payment gateway and then be able to, you know, access the whole world and have the best of the offers which um, are there? So how, how can it all become more collaborative instead of competitive? You've said the right word. How can it be more collaborative? And regulations is one of them. This is the starting point. The second is the true implementation of open banking and the evolution of fintechs. And if you allow me, this is my personal point of view, uh, like you've mentioned, there are too many payment gateways. There are so many uh, uh, retail payments that can be used across, across multiple forms. Uh, the margins on payments have minimized. If you ask my personal point of view, in, 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 in the coming near future, the margins or the profitability you get on payments is going to be minimal. 
payments is going to be to retain clients. You're going to offer payments in certain areas almost free of charge. And especially when we talked about the unbanked or underbanked communities, which is yeah. huge growth areas. If you ask me, look at Southeast Asia, 70% of the population is unbanked or underbanked. Yeah. If I'm a financial institution, I'll be more than willing to provide payments for free if I can bring this money back to the uh, financial sector. I'll give you one example. And this example is because of a client that has announced partnership with us earlier in the year, Tonic Bank. Tonic Bank is out of uh, Singapore, targeting the uh, uh, Philippine market, uh, targeting the unbanked. And in, in some of the discussions I've seen, they are targeting, there's around $140 billion that are not in the banking sector. So they are talking to these people, which will generate around 100 billion of unsecured loans that these could bring more margins uh, uh, to the bank. So in my point of view, the consolidation will happen based on, the, based on highly competitive. And the ones that will retain are the ones that are going to be collaborative, working all together, that's one point. And more importantly is the ones that will be able to offer additional services on top of payments to be able to increase their margins. Sure. And uh, I mean, um, this is, while this is your payment side, but then you also, I mean, if wait for a minute, I can take you and look at the credit side of uh, in banking. Again, you know, I feel that the same rush, everybody offering you that point. 0.005% less value for your credit or your loan is almost killing it. So, you know, how, how, how can you actually, and you know, and honestly, even I felt even since credit card payments, it's very confusing for the customer to, uh, you know, keep account as to how he's spending and how he's billed and how he's going to repay. So, you know, how can we make this entire process much easier? You know, technology, while it's making our lives easier, but it's also making the customer's yeah. life extremely complex because he has no clue how calculations are being done by algorithms. <laughs> you're, actually, you're spot on. And if you review the concept of open banking, and I keep going back to it, how did it start? It started actually, uh, and I'm, I'm going a little bit technical here. It started with um, uh, the UK... Uh, uh, competition and market authority, where, uh, and, and then later on, the Europeans followed it with the PSD2, if you remember. These were the two concepts that have created open banking. So the first concept with the, uh, with the UK comp uh, competition and market authority, it's because of the, exactly the same reason. Uh, as a consumer, you are not aware of what are the charges that are being charged to you. You cannot even compare between one bank to the other because of hidden charges, because of so many things. And they wanted to increase the competitiveness of, uh, uh, of these offerings, thus saving some money and making it much easier on, on the retail customers. This is where they have created the concept of open banking. Let me give you an example. I'm not sure about you, but I do have two bank accounts and I want to consolidate both together. Without the concept of open banking, no way I can do it unless I do my own Excel or blah, blah, blah. Now, with the concept of open banking, there are so many fintechs that can that can be generated in a garage of four or five people that can create an app that can aggregate all my transactions within two banks and can, number one, give me comparison. So, uh, Mr. Wissam, uh, you have a mortgage. Uh, what, uh, what are you paying on your mortgage You've met, or, or your loan? You've mentioned 0.025%. Because open banking allows to see all the offers from all banks, it can tell me, am I overpaying? Am I underpaying? Where should I change? which bank I should go to in one place, in one app. So that has created that flexibility for the for technology will allow you to create that flexibility for the end user via the FinTech to aggregate this information and they have one stop shop. You've also talked about personal financing. If you have multiple accounts and you have multiple transactions, having that FinTech utilizing the APIs on a platform will allow you to manage your finances much better and you become financially literate. That's the entire objective. And you've mentioned as a consumer, how do I know? The objective is to increase literacy by providing aggregation and collaboration and put the power in our hands as, as, as users, be it individuals again or corporates. And that's the entire purpose of having uh, a collaborative platform type uh, of, uh, of interaction between fintechs and banks. 
you know, uh, just for our understanding, tell us a little more about uh, fin Finastra's biggest market. I mean, you know, um, so since you mentioned that you're one of the largest um, uh, sort of API uh, collaboration open banking uh, in the world. Uh, so, uh, what, what, uh, I mean, in in terms of Globe being your entire sort of playground, then what is the biggest market you have right now? Perfect, and and, and thank you for asking me this question. Uh, being a, a company that's one of the largest in terms of employees, revenue, and all the rest in, in, in fintechs, uh, every year we have to come up with something new. And actually, on the contrary, we lead the way in how the financial market works. We are also connected with some regulate, uh, reg regularities or financial bodies, such as SWIFT and the rest, in order to define what's the future of this market. And what, what do we do? And we, you've mentioned, we pride ourselves now to be the the, the first and true open platform for innovation and collaboration. Our objective, our, our mission with Finastra is to unlock the potential of people and businesses in a, in a way where they can collaborate together. So what do we offer or what are, the, uh, what, what are our differentiators? We were able to create a platform uh, that's called fusionfabric.cloud that can be deployed by banks, and this is our latest development, that can be deployed by banks will have access to their, to their internal systems through exposed APIs through any third party. So it can be a fintech, it can be a developer, it can be even a university, anything you want, to kind of develop their own app uh, utilizing our own APIs. On that platform, we've also created, uh, with partnership of Microsoft, uh, on a cloud where they can deploy uh, their app and manage that app. And we've also created um, uh, a place where people can go and download these apps. It's like a store, like Apple Store and anything. So we've created our own app store. When we do that, then that will enable all these financial institutions to truly collaborate and create, I will take it one further step, a marketplace. A marketplace, we've discussed what's the problem of fintechs. Fintechs, the problem is to increase their margins. How can they do that? If you are a fintech that is running on our own marketplace, you have all our 8,500 customers that can contact you and can download the app. If you are one of the 8,500 customers that are really requiring true innovation, you want fast time to market, you can pick any of the apps that are available, that are partnered with us, and within the deployment of four to six weeks, you can actually come up with a new solution. For banks, four to six weeks is nothing, is, is a, a drop of uh, a drop in the, in the big C, because usually a project takes one year and two years and to, in order to implement. So this way of implementation, this way of coming up with services doesn't exist anymore. This is the latest development that we are doing. If you allow me, this is on technology. More importantly, on the verticals. We've mentioned payments in order not to have this discussion all on payments. But the real growth that we are, we are seeing in the market is challenger banks. If you are a challenger bank, and we've mentioned Tonic, for example, that you have a solid business plan and you want to go up and running within six months and you want to target a market and you want to do it all on cloud and you don't want to have any IT developers and you want to outsource anything that is not your domain expertise, you can come work with, with somebody like us with our own partner ecosystem and you can launch your solutions very fast. I'll give you one example. The biggest cost for a bank is to acquire a new client. So acquiring a new client, onboarding a client is, is technically, if you look at it, costs lots of money. We provide a platform. Let's assume, let's assume we don't have a, a, a solution in order to acquire a new client or client onboarding. But there are so many fintechs in this world that have created a way where you can onboard a client digitally in a very fast way. Uh, I can promote one of them, but let's not give one, one of the, our partners' names. Uh, one of our partners have created an application via your iPhone, via your app. You can go open a bank account, take a picture, do your digital sig signature, integrate your core banking system, and in less than four minutes, you have a bank account with a digital signature. Digital signature, it means regularity has to approve. It. So there's always regulations there. This is just a small example of the growth that we are focusing on, such as digital banks. So payments, challenger banks, also, also the, the latest one is technology. 
And here, if you allow me, I, because I like these this, this examples, if you go today to Amazon and you do one or two searches, you will be more bombarded with suggestions. Do this, do that, do whatever. And you've just done a search for a book, for example. Can you imagine how much data the bank has on you? He knows where you have coffee. He knows where you fill your gas. He knows uh, what clothes you buy. He knows if you have a car. He knows your travel habit. They, they know everything about you. And we have artificial intelligence. We have machine learning. We have all the technology in the world to analyze this data in order to come up with a very personalized, specific, not suggestions, even offers. Two or three years back, the best thing the bank could do is a leaflet telling you, come mortgage, we are 1% cheaper than the bank next door. Very generic. These days, what we are allowing these banks in, uh, with a combination of fintechs, where they develop everything, a combination of data, which is, which is very abundant, add to it, uh, 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 technology that's already available, such as AI and machine learning and cloud, add to it a marketplace, gives you huge possibilities, huge possibilities to really drive change in the financial market and offer new solutions that are targeted, in my point of view, for three main reasons. Number one, customer satisfaction. As a consumer now, you demand same service from your bank like from your retail store. Exactly the same. Number two, increase profitability because you are coming up with new innovative solutions that can bring uh, uh, some uh, extra uh, uh, margins to your business. I want to stop on this to talk a little bit about SMEs. I've read a McKinsey report not long time ago. They said that there is a staggering amount of around $8.5 billion of fees and charges that the bank could charge for SMEs, small and medium enterprises, if they truly offer a fully fledged automated digital experience. So if the banks do this, they're going to increase their margins, you know. So client satisfaction, increasing, increasing your margins, and number three, remaining relevant for growth. This is what we believe is the future of what we are offering to this market. Sure. And I think uh, you're looking in the right direction, that's for sure. <laughs> Um, you know, finally, um, uh, I would want to know, I mean, you know, given the fact that, um, as I had said, that APAC, particularly if you see um, Singapore, if you see Hong Kong, they've made some great stride when it comes to fintech. So what do you think? And then, of course, I also feel that the Middle East itself is doing a lot of work in fintech too. Uh, Bahrain have their own, uh, you know, uh, fintech yeah. day. Yeah. And uh -huh. uh, so... Um, do you think the the, uh, the way forward in the next three to four years is for fintech to really move globally or for every country to develop its own sort of fintech startups and therefore be able to, uh, you know, see that our country needs these solutions and therefore, uh, you know, we're going to make our own fintech properties. But as an organization, you're a global organization, Finastra. So, I mean, what, what is the way forward? And how do you think the best practices can move from between one country to the other? Perfect. Your question is spot on. And uh, I answer it, you need two things. You need standard regulations and standard technology or formats and standard procedures. Like, like we do with everything, like FIX, like SWIFT, like you name it. Once you achieve these two, then it's limitless what you can, what you can do. I see that any fintech being a, a large technology company uh, can operate globally. Of course, there are some localizations. Of course, there's in India or in Singapore or in Bahrain, they might have different requirements than others. But in general, uh, probably 80% of the requirements for banking services are the same. So the FinTech, in order to be able to operate globally, it has to have standards and it has to have the common regularities. And that's the future growth for FinTechs, which is dependent on regulations uh, in most of the cases. That's why if, when we did our own survey, there are 54% of our repliers said the government or the regulator, regulations are the main hindrance for the growth of FinTech and digitalization. So in, in terms of uh, changes, I don't believe that the, the, what is required uh, uh, is, is, is a small FinTech by country. But what is required 
standardization of regulations. And you've mentioned Bahrain Fintech Bay or the IFC or in Singapore. These are just uh, uh, one step that the government is doing, which is a very important step to encourage fintechs. Because fintechs, think of it this way, fintechs biggest problem is funding. They are small, they don't have the money, and they need some encouragement. Creating a sandbox, creating an environment, inviting people such as Finestra, which we are very abundant with regularities. Bahrain Fintech, Fintech Bay is one of our main partners, where we provide for free the infrastructure to encourage these Fintechs to build. So these are encouragements in order to make sure that this, is, this will advance. But to reach where we want, we need standardization. That's the only way where we can advance as, as, as globally and come up with a solution that's standard and really put us at the forefront of innovation and not be considered in financial sectors as laggards of technology, but rather the best utilizers of technology and the purpose of having best, best and better customer uh, service and customer experience. Sure. Um, so finally, as we end this talk, I mean, you know, I would love uh, if you can tell us what could be uh, what could be better ways for fintechs to raise funding. I mean, I, I talked to a lot of fintech startups and I, they the problem, and you also said that fintech uh, funding is always a challenge. So do you think in the future there would be more institutional funding that fintechs will get from you know venture capitalists or private equity uh, firms, or do you think it would be one fintech supporting the other fintech? They might want to invest in some other fintechs because there are some synergies they have between each other. This is, this is a, an excellent question. And let, let's end where we started with COVID and the pandemic. The pandemic and the economic slowdown has created a burden on these small fintechs. They cannot afford to survive. So yes, some fintechs will disappear if there's not enough funding that's, that's going to come to help them. And where will that funding come from? In my point of view, you are spot on. It can come from many sources, but most of the sources, in my point of view, is other fintechs, such as ourselves, mm -hmm. investing and helping and funding. And the second part is the banks themselves. If you look, sure. Also, I've mentioned that banks initially looked at them as competitors. Now they are looking at them, how can we collaborate? And they have found at least three ways of collaboration. Number one, they invested themselves in fintechs. And it can, they can go all the way to even create a new bank under their own umbrella with a different name, you know, and it's a window for digitalization and all the rest. Second, they invested in fintechs that are already existed, either for them to totally work for them or just takes uh, some stakes in them in case these have grown. So if you, if you talk to a CIO of a bank now, he will tell you he have a budget to invest in fintechs. Third, how would they get their funding? Maybe better than funding is to get market opportunity and access. And this is where Finestra comes in. I can go to any, any FinTech as Finestra, rather than giving him X dollar to survive for the coming two months, I can tell him, please come to my platform. I have 8,500 clients. I have 95 of the largest banks on my platform. Bring your application in and let's work together and we commercialize that solution. So I it's believe a community it's place. Possible. So whoever has the biggest community. Of course, that's that's a, that's the definition of a marketplace, and this is how us and banks use our our size, our contacts, our uh, clients in order to advance that, uh, uh, if you like, that fintech and that's a new business. And I think this model will work very well for in the future. Great, and we hope to see play many more fun, uh, fintech companies like fintech uh, Finastra to become bigger and larger and going across the world and helping other fintechs to also find their way and grow forward. Thank you very much for uh, joining us here today for this talk with Puri. We, uh, you know, we really appreciate your time and also the fact that you brought us so many things. And any fintechs who want to reach out uh, to more customers, of course, please, uh, uh, you know, you can reach out to Wisdom himself and uh, he could give you some more ideas. Um, you know, as we conclude this talk, we'll be bringing you five number of talks in fintech and other technology spaces at Tech Talks uh, Entrepreneur APAC. If you have more questions, please feel free to put your questions in the comment box. And we'll hopefully uh, answer it. And please like our pages and tell us how you like this episode. Thank you again for joining us, Wisdom.